are delighted to introduce nationhood, patriotism, and Desh Bhakti. The evolution of modern India is a unique offering to the historical, socio-political, and psychological study of nationhood. Saket Suman's enlightening book, The Psychology of a Patriot, presents a thought-provoking chronicle of India. Makaran Paranjipe's upcoming books are JNU, Nationalism, and India's Uncivil War. Gurmeher Kaur's most recent work, The Young and the Restless, Youth and Politics in India, explores the electoral and ideological involvement of the youth in Indian democracy as it presents a dexterous generational evaluation of political identity. Academic and author Badri Narayan's Republic of Hindutva, How the Sangh is Reshaping Indian Democracy, examines the involving structures and system of beliefs that comprise the RSS. In conversation with author and academic Mukulika Banerjee, they discuss the coming of age of an entire nation focusing on its foundations and future. Saket Suman is a writer, journalist, and literary chronicler. He is the author of The Psychology of a Patriot. As a journalist, he has worked at the Statesman, Indo-Asian News Service, and the Times Group. Besides being published extensively on popular culture, politics, and human rights in reputed newspapers, magazines, and news portals. Makaran Paranjabe has been a professor of English at JNU, New Delhi. He served as the director of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla, and is the author and editor of over 50 books, 180 academic papers, and thousands of articles. Paranjrape is currently a columnist in Open Magazine, Gulf News, The New Indian Express, and First Post. Gurmeher Kaur is a social activist who published her first book, Small Acts of Freedom, at JLF in 2018. In 2017, Kaur was listed by Time magazine as a next generation leader, a global listing of 10 young men and women making a difference in the world. Her second book, The Young and the Restless, Youth and Politics in India, was shortlisted for the Sahitya Academy Yuva Puraskar in 2021. She co-founded Citizens for Public Leadership, an independent non-partisan movement focused on advocating for progressive public policy in India. Badri Narayan, social historian and cultural anthropologist, is the director of G.B. Pant Social Science Institute, Allahabad. Besides having written a number of articles, both in English and Hindi, he has recently authored Republic of Hindutva and other critically acclaimed books. Mukulika Banerjee is a professor at LSE and was the inaugural director for the LSE South Asia Center from 2015 to 2020. She has published extensively on Indian democracy and her brand new book, Cultivating Democracy, Politics and Citizenship in a Great in India, was published by Oxford University Press. Na ladies and gentlemen, nationhood, patriotism, and Desh Bhakti, Saket Suman, Makaran Paranjpe, Gurmeher Kaur, Badri Narayan, in conversation with Mukulika Banerjee. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you to all for, for having a quick lunch and coming to this session. Uh, it's a great crowd. I hope uh, you managed to catch some of the last session in this room, and even if there's no overlap in the audience, let's hope the vibes in the room have some of the overlaps, because I think a lot of the discussion about dissent and democracy are going to come up in uh, today's conversation. I hope we have, as you've heard, a fantastic panel of speakers, but they don't always agree which is why we are sitting together and we're going to have a civilized debate and we'll be set with each other. Now, it's interesting, if you look at the title of this uh, uh, panel discussion, it introduces these two English terms, nationalism and patriotism. And we sometimes mistakenly use them interchangeably. We think nationalism and patriotism are the same thing. It's about the nation. It is about loyalty, it is about attachment, but clearly they are not the same thing. Otherwise, why would you have two different words? And if you think about the books that our panelists have written, they have words like patriot, nationalism, uh, uh, freedom, republic in their titles. So our speakers today have thought about these terms and I've asked them in preparation for today's panel discussion, 
to elucidate these words a little bit more. The third term is a Hindi word, Deshbhakti. And what does Desh, why are we using the word Deshbhakti alongside these two contentious English terms that of course were defined during the colonial period and have had a post-colonial life. We know that for instance, a great patriot like Tagore thought nationalism was a very dangerous thing. Why that was the case? Those are the kind of questions we want us to think about. But if Deshbhakti is a Hindi term, I think one more term that we need to put in there is the word Rashtravadi. It's a word that is used on the street. I'm an anthropologist, I hear it. Aapko sarkar pasand nahi hai, lekin hum to Rashtravadi hai. Which has a series of implications that I think we should think about. If you're not a Rashtravadi, what are you? What is the Hindi word for it? The word anti-national is an English word. So if Rashtravadi is said, by a young activist on the street to somebody who he does not agree with in their critique of any government, then what is the Hindi word for it? And I'm delighted that we have such bilingual speakers in this panel. So in the order that they came on stage and in the order that their names appear on the program, I've requested the panelists to just elucidate some of these words for about five minutes each, and then we'll come back and sort of have more of an interactive discussion. Do you want to start? Thanks. Hello. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. I have a lot of things to say, but we all have limited time, so I'll come straight to the reading. This is an extract from my book, which sort of summarizes the arguments that I put forth in my book. So I'll come straight to it. Please pay attention. These are not the best of times to be optimistic. These are not the best of times to be nostalgic, but patriotism asks of us to cherish our freedom and to honor its sanctity by remembering how we became us and how we lived in our lives in the larger course of the nation. We have landed in a phase where we need to look back and identify the reasons why we went wrong. We must introspect and ask ourselves how we let our people down. We should stop concealing stories of our failures, lies, and deceptions because patriots are not hypocrites. If patriotism is the affection of the people for their country, we need to look at and appreciate the things that bind us in this common thread. And we should hone and cherish the courage that it takes to speak up for national ideals while recognizing the courage of those who have done so at considerable costs to themselves. Slowly, the haze clears. And the epic goddess of India reveals herself to us in quite a different avatar. It is on this promise that we have come thus far. Our hearts beat against our breaths as we reaffirm our will to march onwards in its light. But isn't that the colonization of our minds once again? Like innocent children sing their school songs and build up vivid imaginations in their heads about how their school is the best school that there is and why they should respect its souls like a religion. Isn't that how they tamed our minds when we were young? So on a far greater level, mankind as a species, all of us will need to realize that the most complex challenges we face are common. Liberty and equality give patriotism its authority. Somebody who's not faced with unreasonable restrictions and is treated equally is more likely to feel patriotic than those whose voices are throttled and who have been marginalized by our societies in centuries. Patriotism means different things to different people because in our society, we have different standards of judging people. We must respect our people and believe that all are equal in our nations and all nations in the world are equal. When there is equality in and among all nations, there'll be harmony in the planet. When there is harmony in the planet, patriotism will drive our zeal to find solutions to mankind's gravest problems, to address inequality and give everybody the dignity of our shared evolution from apes to humans. 
that is the ancient indian understanding of vasudeva kutumbakam which finds resonance in my understanding of patriotism until unless we reach there patriotism will remain a sham it will remain an invisible moral authority that prevents us from seeing the invisible from seeing that there are greater things at play that there are deep states that there are corporations and there are powers that be those that do not go away with the rise and fall of the governments they are always there i'll skip some of it in this moment of grief and misery there is a faint gleam of hope that is rising like a beautiful sunrise at the horizon the ordinary citizens of india the most essential depiction of bharat mata have risen to the occasion we have become each other's saviors when everybody in power seems to have deserted us we know that there is only so much we can do when resources are scarce but we hope that change is on its way and we are doing everything we can to ease the pain till then we need to become us again and reflect on the said values that make us indians just because we have fallen we must not let our spirits die just because we are angry we must not lose our national pride just because we are overcome by sorrow we must not close all doors for light to seep in it is a long journey ahead it is a long journey ahead a lifelong mission to reignite the eternal flame of india and then to rebuild our lost glory by reinstilling hope in our people how we as indians respond in the aftermath of the pandemic will decide the future of our great nation are we going to do what our government tells us to or are we going to make the government do what we the people wanted to are we going to let the government define what patriotism is or are we going to define it as patriots are we going to blindly cheer for populist leaders and their divisive agendas or are we going to do the patriotic thing our bit for the common good thank you professor banerji sri pranjape sri narayan gurmeher for sharing the stage with me my book is available at the festival store and i hope you buy it it's called the psychology of a patriot thank, thank you. you thank you saket that's that you know what i think is very useful with with what you've told us saket is that terms like nationalism desh bhakti patriotism are concepts but at the heart of it the question is what citizens are meant to be doing and there is i think the distinction between being vigilant citizens which is what democracy demands of you and being vigilantes which is what seems to be produced by a certain kind of politics so uh, makarand over to you thank you so much i think i'm going to follow uh, saket's example and talk about my book which is just out it came yesterday so thank you so my remarks are in the context of what happened in jnu the book is called jnu nationalism in india's uncivil war now there are two ways of looking at this book one is that it is the biography of a university which turns 50 or has turned 50 and a better part i mean of the last 20 30 years when the university really came up i have been a full professor at jnu since 1999 so i was an insider to some of the events that happened in the last 4 5 years in which jnu became as it were a platform in which ideas of india were debated and a simplistic way of framing this debate would be national versus anti national or desh todo versus desh jodo but what i do in this book is to propose and demonstrate what i call an intermedial hermeneutics so it's a way of reading which can in a way in you know create a space between these polarities and if you do it properly what is intermedial becomes remedial it can become healing because what i saw in jnu is the destruction of that middle ground of civilized dissent disagreement dialogue discussion and uh, i was drawn into the vortex of this debate willingly precisely because of a series of lectures what the nation needs to know and i made the point that a university should not be used as a platform to attack an elected government the main 
function of a university is academics. And of course, I was surrounded and corralled. And so I evolved this typology of uh, how, you know, these lobbies try to cancel you. I call it the punch of Bakar. So first you're branded, they say you're some Hindutva Vadi or you're whatever Brahminical. These are terms, okay? We don't know what they mean. So first you get branded, then you get browbeaten, okay? That if you don't follow the dominant uh, ideology or the dominant line, they bully you. So branding, then browbeating, then, as I said, bullying, then it's boycott. So if you organize an event, nobody will come. I have four students in my class, okay, even today. So you're under a shadow ban, a shadow boycott, okay? And in your own campus, they say, oh, you're the internal enemy, okay? So then there's the boycott. And if that doesn't work, then there's the fifth bakar, what I call, please pardon the language, bullshit, which is you get engaged in all kinds of nonsensical controversies, you get trolled. And in my case, there were five, I mean, there were 10 open letters written against me and I've replied to them. And those open letters are also reproduced here. So this book is actually about Tagore, Gandhi and what's left of the nation. There's very little left of the nation by the time you're done with destroying, you know, what these ideas were. And of course, Tagore was a great critic of nationalism and have shown his life goes through five phases as Savita Sachi Bhattacharya shows. But, you know, nationalism was a code word in Tagore for imperialism because for him, the nation was extending itself and dominating others. He didn't mean Shodeshi Shomaj, which he wrote about earlier. So all of that is in the book. Then Gandhi's in the book. So the point I'm trying to make is that we have to find a way to talk to each other and not brand each other and create this extremely polarizing and divisive narrative. And a university should still be a place where ideas are debated, discussed, people go to classes. And uh, my university was shut down for two years. You know, there were no classes and there were, there were pitched battles going on and all of that is here. And I, I dislike the fact that outsiders came to my university and one of my colleagues was also in Manhattan. I was in Shimla at that time. So I've taken positions against uh, the politicization, over-politicization of campuses, the destruction of the intellectual life and freedom, you know? And I want to say this, that India is the most liberal society traditionally because people were not nailed to a cross for their beliefs, you know? And the, liber the liberalism of India was not only physical or emotional or intellectual, it was spiritual. It's, this is a spiritual democracy. You can follow any path you like, you know, you know, or Ano Bhadra Kritavo Yantu Sarvasa. Let noble thoughts come to us from all sides. So then you create this narrative, and then I call it a competition between two forms of intolerance. Okay. So we, we don't want in my view, left intolerance being substituted by right intolerance, because there's no right intolerance at all, okay? So you need a space in India and in universities where many ideas can flourish and there's an interchange. And this book actually documents what happened in one university in India, which is in the limelight. It's always rated as one of the best universities. And as an insider, I tell, exactly what happened. And the last thing I want to say is that, you know, there was an attempt to cancel this book. And since I have a non-disclosure agreement, I'm not going to go into the details, but the fact is that when the book was going to be released, the cover was made, I, I read the proofs, then something happened. And they said, you know what? The times are difficult. And as a publisher, we don't want to take a risk. So we are going to put it through one more legal read. And then they asked me to make 183 changes or edits or deletions. And I said, this is censorship. So who stands for freedom here? And I wanted to pull out because I didn't have the time, the energy or the money to afford lawyers and to get into this protracted fight. I wanted my book to come out. So there's a hundred ways you can kill a book is what I want to say. Yeah. And I'm grateful to my publishers, Rupa 
for agreeing to publish this book. So if you're interested in India, if you're interested in nationalism and its different varieties, read this book. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Makarin. I'm, I'm assuming that the word uncivil in your, the title of your book refers to the inability to have a dialogue, but also the inability of the state to protect students who are citizens of the country on campus. So the, when the arm of the state, when the police get involved, when people are identified on camera and people like Komal Basin are still out unarrested, when there is evidence that they were wielding sticks to beat students with, that is also a lack of civility. Right? There is no constitutional rights being protected of students. And as another professor, I would, I have a slightly different view of the university to you. Think, of course, that is in fact when students should be discussing whether the government is good or bad. It's in fact, it is the only time in your life where you're allowed to have extreme emotions, extreme positions, debate, argue, listen. I completely agree that you should learn to listen as well. But it cannot be the case that you have a university where you can't discuss these things. What else are universities for? Right? Thank you. Thank you, Mukhalika. Um, thank you, Saket and Dr. Paranjpe. Well, I don't have a book. I don't have a book with me right now to show you and sell, but please buy it. Um, <laughs> but you know, when I think about patriotism, one of the moment anyone brings up the word, the first memory I have is also one of the first memories of my father, and and how he would, as a child, he would, you know, as a child, instead of holding my hand and saying namaste. Uh, or Satsriyakar, he would, I would salute and say Jai Hind because he was in the military. And, you know, until, until, until I couldn't because he just wasn't there after, after he passed away in the war. And I don't think in my, you know, ever since I, ever since he's been there, ever since I've lost him, I've never, growing up, I've never thought about patriotism very much. I've never thought about, am I a patriot? Am I not a patriot? You know, I've done the thing, you go, you know, you stand up, in your, you know, you, you cheer for your cricket team when it wins, you watch Chuck the India get a bit emotional when, you know, these, these scenes of uh, young women winning come on. Um, and then you stand in your school assembly, sometimes you are excited about the national anthem, sometimes you're not, depends on the breakfast you've had. But ever since, you know, but, but and, I, and, I, and I've never, and I think that's also the same with everybody else, right? Do you remember growing up and really thinking about, are you a patriot? Right, and today we're sort of, and today we're having this conversation because we're forced to think of your patriot. We're forced to define patriotism. We're forced to, um, you know, we're forced to define our love for some, you know, our very, very noble, very simple emotion, love for a country, love for a home in these words, in these terms. And not only are we meant to prove it, we're also asked to question whether other people are patriots or not, whether other people are, you know, are nationalists or not. And that's something that I find, you know, deeply, deeply problematic. Um, in 2017, uh, you know, it was my first year of college and I was hounded. You know, we talk about civility and we talk about debate and universities, it was 2017. I'm 19 years old, so my first year in college and I was hounded by politicians, ABVP students, mobs, cricketers, and they all called me anti-national. It's been five years ever since and I've, you know, and I've deeply, and I've, and I've taken time to deeply reflect about what, you know, what it means to be Indian and what is India. You know, how do I define my love for my country? And I'm questioning, why do I have to define my love for the country? You know, why is it that there's only, why is it that today there's only one form of patriot, patriotism that is accepted? You know, the chest thumping, war mongering, hyper-nationalist version. You know, why is it that wherever anyone questions the government, you know, local or central, that, uh, that were labeled anti-national. And I think this, and, and, and for me, you know, my allegiance is to the country. It's not to a man, it's not to a party. Um, and I believe that, you know, and I believe, and I believe that's the same for everyone. Our love is, you know, our love is for this nation. Our love isn't for one man. And I think India is not synonym, you know, with, with a party or a man. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, Kurnayan. And finally, Padri, of course, has published a book called Republic of Hindutva, as we heard. And I've uh, requested Padri to really reflect a little bit on the notion of the republic. Um, it's one that I've been thinking about a lot, writing about democracy. And I would, uh, in one sentence, if I just summarize it, Padri, I would say that you can't have good democratic culture without having a good republic and without uh, citizenship of a republic. But uh, over to you now. Yeah, thank you, Jele, for inviting me uh, in this discussion. Uh, see, uh, republic, why I use the republic term in my book? Uh, you know, my publisher has also contribution in giving the titles. So, so it's not solely mine, also publisher's contribution in that. But republic here I use as a metaphor. Metaphor of changing the concept of the Sangha. Because uh, republic in that way, more uh, flexible, inclusive, concept than the nation. No, nation is a much, uh, it's a bit a strict, uh, rigid category. And the republic is must, much inclusive. I'm not saying that it's converted in, in, in a republic, but it's, it's just a kind of the source that changes in the concept. And, you know, uh, uh, there is uh, someone asked to a uh, rural person in the villager, what is this for you? She said, Jahan tak dikhta hai, wahan tak desh hai. Uske baad bhi desh hai. So, so desh in that way is very, very interesting concept. So, uh, I, I tell you one very interesting experience. In this election, uh, RSS cadres were going to the villages, talking to the MBCs and uh, Dalit people, and saying, Rast ke, they were not saying ki BJP ko vote dena hai. They were saying, Rast ke naam par is par vote dena hai. Is par Rast ke naam pe vote di chai. So we followed them after five, six days, we again visited to that area and tried to see what happened of this rust. And uh, we went, when we went to there, everyone started saying, Bahut mahangai hai, bahut garibi hai, bahut hai, this and bahut that. Phir ka kya karenge? Kaha desh ke naam pe vote denge. Desh ke liye vote denge. So rust become desh. Rust is perceived as desh. It is in your mind, I don't know what is in which concept rust means for you. But for commoner, for the subaltern, for the marginal people, Rast is desh. Or desh, jo jahan tak dikhta hai, jahan wahi desh. The desh means the mati pani. Mati pani, jisko se aap feel kar sake, jisko which you can experience. That's desh for them. So every day, meaning of the, uh, meaning of the nation in everyday life has a different connotation. And that connotation is the connotation of desh. So, and this desh is in, in, is, uh, does not come from the outside. It originates from your uh, everyday experience in, the, uh, in your life. And, and, but, but it may be evoked, it may be mobilized, it may be uh, used in certain context. But for public, it's a desh. So, so desh is, a, is a, in that way bhav. And, but this bhav may be recreated, uh, uh, activated by various kinds of ways. Uh, of uh, various kinds of creative culture of evocation that can, that may be different thing. So uh, Republic I use uh, just to show that how uh, this uh, RSS and, and, and they are walking, uh, sorry, RSS and their walking uh, style and the, the ways they are going to walk is, is trying to include others and in that process their book worries are also being changed they are, they are also being changed in that process because they want to enter in a domain which was uh, which was which has very different uh, uh, book worry, very different dictionary if you go in villages and talk to the people rast jante no one knows about rast if you talk to people jantantra jante no one knows about jantantra but they know dignity they know saman so, so uh, uh, the way uh, RSS and the Sangha organizations are dealing with the, these communities, with, with uh, facilitating their, their Samman, in that way they are trying to, re that's why I say in that book, reshaping, uh, uh, reshaping democracy, because uh, this is a reshaping, reshaping uh, in terms of, the, in, in a very different diction, in a very different way, but it has not yet conceptualized well. 
uh, it has not been well conceptualized because we have not done much research on that. So there is a need to document the entire processes of these new changes. And then we can reconceptualize that what is happening uh, uh, in, in this, uh, is this domain of uh, using nation or discussing about nation and discussing about desh and how this desh is being perceived by uh, this uh, common people. So, you have seen that the people of the desh will vote in the name of the desh. The position narrative was so popular that those who were going to vote BJP, they were also saying that Mahangai hai, garibi hai, but vote in the name of the desh. So, so that's very, uh, in that way, very interesting um, uh, ways to deal with all that. So, Thank you. Thank you, Badu. I mean, thank you for, uh, for setting out these different terms. The word desh in Bengali too and other Indian languages really is about where you come from. Right? It's not nation in the way that the English word is. And the distinction between rashtra and nation and desh and, and the republic are in fact critical here. What we haven't talked about at all is bhakti. Desh bhakti is also in the title and neither, neither of, none of our panelists have yet talked about either Desh Bhakti or just the Bhakti word that has come into the lexicon now, and we must unpack that too. Now, at this point, the panelists continue to talk, and you just sit there waiting with your questions, and then we take only two. So I'm going to change things slightly and start taking questions now. I know that you have questions and you want rebuttals to uh, come back, and of course, you'll get a chance to do that. But perhaps you could do that in response to a question from the audience as well incorporate it in. So does anyone have an early question? Otherwise, we have plenty to talk about. Yeah, if there's I, someone, I, uh, yeah, all of you just charge your mics. Um, I, I we have a question there. It's a quick point, but I don't mind being. Okay, let's wait. Let, there's a gentleman ready. Hi. Uh, hi, this is Imtiaz Al. Uh, when we were students... Uh, Can you hold it for, closer to yourself? We can't hear you. Uh, is it an effort of the government to keep uh, the university apolitical just because uh, if they are more aware and they will ask questions, that will hurt them? Because during our time when we were students, some of us uh, got showcase notice from the vice chancellor that your son is involved in subversive activity. And in bracket, it was written as pamphlet and postering. What's that? And what? we were and sorry, in brackets it was written what? Pamphlet and postering. Pamphlet and postering. And we were fighting against fee hype. <laughs> what? We were fighting against fee hike. Hike of the fees in the campus. Oh my. Okay, can I just come in for yes. a quick moment? I mean, this book also has this agitation over the fee hike in JNU. Now the fees are 20 rupees a month, okay? It's not enough to pay the salary of one professor. So this is what I call pseudo-socialism, all right? There has to be some correlation, all right? There has to be some correlation between the cost of education and what you pay for it. And I've written in this book, give everybody a loan so that they can get educated, but you want free, I mean, look, what happened in JNU, things have changed, but people stayed for 10 years, 15 years, cheap food, subsidized lodging, and you use the whole university as a platform to elect, uh, to, to criticize, I, I don't mind criticism, but to try to actually unseat an elected government, and you don't go to classes. Excuse me, what's the university for? Is it for patronizing a class or cadre of parasitic people all that they've trained in doing is politicking. And you ask them in an English department to write one paragraph. They can't write one paragraph of sensible prose. So this was going on. And I'm really sorry, Gordon Mahad. One minute, I'll just take one minute. Let me finish my point. Don't interrupt me. Let me finish my point. Another minute. Yeah, a minute. I'm very sorry to hear what happened to Gordon Mahad. Nobody should be called an anti-national for criticizing their government. It is my government, I pay taxes. I'm a stakeholder, I'm against sedition laws. This is rubbish. This is a colonial inheritance, but every party has used it. But it's not that one lot is intolerant. You see, you call somebody a Sanghi, 
you call somebody a chaddi you call somebody a bhakt that's a form of you know intolerance of the worst kind why why is anybody untouchable therefore therefore what i'm saying is our nationalism shouldn't be so thick skinned as in a neighboring country that you can put people in concentration camps break down the houses of worship and they don't international opinion doesn't count no should it be so thick skinned that you can't stand criticism you know of course we should have criticism that's what universities are for thank you okay thank you of course we should have criticisms whatever we may think of students and i say this the older i get as a professor the more under the further i get away from the age group of students the more sympathetic i am because if they are making misguided criticisms they are making unreasonable demands you don't let the police unleash violence on them. that can't be right you don't do and if we have the technology to find the people who were wielding violence and they run free what kind of a you know what kind of institution forget whether it's jnu whether it's do i'm a do student let me just say i got clear i'm not a jnu alumna any university lse where i teach what kind of a university is this the fee hike you talk about you know this representation of parasites misguided socialism there are some institutions that require patronage so that you give a small chance to a student from a small little village somewhere in odisha to come to delhi for that student it would be unthinkable to come and study in delhi if that means as a taxpayer my money subsidizes the student we do it that's uh, i didn't know the moderator was a part of this debate and is taking sides i mean she's okay. getting so can i come in now yes i'll come in now i'll come in now i mean there are only two women on the panel you've had your time i'm sorry there are only two women on the panel yes yeah 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 uh, अब कुछ आराम से हिंदी में आपको बताते हैं क्योंकि यहाँ पे बहुत आगे बात बढ़ गई है सो so, आराम से समझिए इस बात को आई एम आई हैवन ट्रेड योर बुक एंड आई एम लीस्ट क्वालिफाइड टू कमेंट ऑन इट सो इट्स नॉट अ कमेंट ऑन योर बुक ना इधर योर अबिलिटी और एनीथिंग लाइक दैट नॉट योर क्रेडेंसिल्स योर वेरी क्वालिफाइड एंड आई फुल रेस्पेक्ट फॉर यू बट हैविंग सेट दैट इस हॉल में बैठे सब लोग बराबर नहीं है जी इस हॉल में बैठे सभी लोग बराबर नहीं है हमारे देश के सभी लोग बराबर नहीं है तो जब आप ये जेएनयू के बीस रुपए की बात कर रहे हो ना फीस की या आप कुरेद रहे हो या आप लोगों को तंग कर रहे हो बीस रुपए बीस रुपए भी लोगों का सपना होता है इन अ कंट्री वे पीपल आर डाइंग ऑफ स्टारवेशन यू कैन नॉट डू दैट नंबर वन नंबर टू नंबर टू कुछ चीजें राष्ट्र सेवा होती है सो पब्लिक यूनिवर्सिटीज में अगर आप एक रुपए भी ले रहे हो यू शुड नॉट बी डूइंग दैट फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल You should not be doing that. First of all, instead of saying that 20 rupees, me, you, you 20 rupees, not give. 20 rupees, your country, many people have 20 rupees. Can I just I say? I want to respond very quickly. Makkala, you won't do it quickly. Let's just. I won't do it. I won't speak. I won't. It's very difficult. 40 seconds. Look, look, 30 no, no, seconds. No, no, no. I'll tell you. You know, I, I want to say, make it, make it free. Make it free. I've said it in the book. Don't make it 20. Don't have a pretense of giving fees. Make it free. Excellent. and make them attend classes Excellent. that's my point that's fine make them attend classes as well are there any women there's a woman here yeah uh, just a quick question does the idea of desh and desh bhakti change when it is uh, uh, as a doctrine when it's been given up does the idea when you're speaking of desh bhakti Sorry. You can't hear your question. Yeah, go ahead. I don't see too many people wearing masks anyway. So um, the idea of desh and desh bhakti does it change uh, when you're at the receiving end of it and at the um, excellent question doctrine end of it? Okay, let's hold that. Does the idea of desh bhakti change if you're at the receiving end of it or when you're meeting it out? So just park that idea. Can we take a couple? Of, there's a gentleman right at the back. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, I have not so much a question, but uh, an observation. 
we talked about, and especially you, Ms. Kaur, I was very taken by what uh, occurred to you, uh, that you are with the government, and if you are not with the government in whatever policy, then you are anti-national. We have seen this many times that come up in newspapers, in the media, people talk about it. So it suddenly struck me that in an election, if you do not vote for the incumbent government, and you vote against them, as indeed has happened across the country today, that the ruling party, the party that has won, has got about 40% of the vote. 60% was not won by the party that has actually won. Does this mean that 60% who voted against that party are anti-national? Because they voted against the party that is in power. So it's just an observation. I want to know what do you think about that. Okay, so I don't know whether it sounds really not very good, but the question is people who don't. BJP at the moment at the central government has a 35% vote share. What happens to the rest of the 65%? If you don't vote for the ruling party, are you a Desh Drohi or an anti-national? Okay. There's a young woman here. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. A woman here. I'm not being ageist. Yeah. Uh, so for a lot of us, patriotism is about loyalty to let's say the democratic ethos of the constitution or the pluralistic, syncretic values that we hold dear to ourselves. So when there's a certain narrative out there where nationalism is, let's say, more about geographical territory than being people-centric or citizen-centric, do you think it's because of our inability to work out a post-colonial, a post-monarchical definition of uh, nationalism? Because sort of the like colonial power it was about territorial expansion. So do you think that it's, it's sort of our inability to work out a, a version of nationalism that is different from what colonial legacy has Thank taught you. us. Okay. So is post-colonial nationalism different from the nationalism of the, of the independence movement? We'll take one question. There's a woman here in the, on, in the red. And that'll be our last question because that leaves you all about a minute to respond uh, till the end. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have more of a narrative that I would just quickly want to share that I was... I'm a student from Jamia and I was doing my mass communication when the protests happened. And uh, at that point of time, the emotional anxieties of all the students and, you know, the way the media brandished the entire college in a certain way. So much so that when I went for a debate competition to another college of the Delhi University, they saw my ID card. They took me, Allah say, to another corner to check my bag and my, you know, belongings thoroughly where it wasn't happening for any of the other students. Or when you go on stage to you know, to deliver your speech and you end up winning, you will hear people talking about the fact that, you know, it's a Jamia student winning in a college, which is, you know, over, which is, you know, there is a majority uh, of people who do not agree with what you've said on stage. So What's at that point, of, uh, yeah, so at that point of time, how do you deal with it also, you know, because when uh, at that point of time, you also feel that, you know, when you're saying something against the majority, it's also, it also becomes a privilege because you have the voice and the agency to say it. So how do you, you know, overcome that and how do you empower people who do not have this kind of privilege to thank talk you. about it in, more, in, more, in a way more effective manner? Okay, yes. thank you. I'm going to forego my one minute and take one more question. So this gentleman right in front here. Wait for the microphone, please. But quickly, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, so basically, I, I think the gentleman over there said that JNU is in a very dilapidated state. And basically, it's not, uh, it, it's not the kind of uh, university that it should be. But then when it comes to the rankings, it, it is one of the most esteemed institutions in the country. So I don't understand the dichotomy over here when the government says that JNU is basically a hub for communists, a hub for leftists, and a hub for all these people. But then ultimately, they are, they are probably ranking them as one of the best institutions in the country. And then one, one, one last thing I want to say that uh, the best thing about BJP is that uh, there's a quote by Arthur Schopenhauer, which is that one who caters to the fool will always be assured of a large audience. And demagoguery is one thing that is ever present in the Indian democracy. So be it Modi, he, he very sort of with, with a lot of chest Sorry, thumping said that- Please don't make speeches, we're running out okay. of time. Oh, so just you. my question is that why in the 21st century, we're still obsessed with demagog demagoguery, nationalism, and we don't actually want votes on the basis of work, or, or other things that matter. So that would Thank be my you. question. Thank you. Thank you. Civility is also giving people the space to respond. Thank you. So we'll start, we'll turn the order around. 
Padri will start. Padri talked about the non-JMU bits. Many arguments have come up about vote shares if you don't vote for the government. Why don't you address those questions? And maybe from the lady from Jamia. So over to you. Uh, this is very polarized <laughs> atmosphere. <laughs> Uh, polarized in terms of questions and answers. Yeah. We are more polarized than them. They are representing everybody. Uh, see, uh, I'm going to respond only one question uh, about Desh Bhakti. How Desh Bhakti is being received or for me, Desh Bhakti, Desh is a bhav. And Desh is as a bhav flows in our culture. You know, if you have folk songs, you have a lot of stories defining Desh, not nation, Desh. Desh has different meaning, as I said. Uh, Kolkata is also the Desh sometimes in, in folk songs. So, so Desh, uh, uh, so Desh has multiple meaning in our society, and we we receive it in our own ways. Uh, subaltern elites uh, they have different notions of the Desh and the uh, caste. So Desh as a how it has a multiple ways of receiving it, and and uh, everyone add in that. I add in that the meaning in, with your own imagination, and in that way they invent uh, their nation. Apna desh khud banate hai. Desh koi aapko deta nahi hai. Desh aapke bhitar aap khud rachte hai apna desh. Aur roj roj rachte hai. Aur aur wo kisi ke define karne aur kisi ke rokne se nahi rukta hai. Wo ek bhav hai jo jo ek certain condition mein aap usko evoke bhi kar sakte hai. Aap usko politically use bhi kar sakte hai. Aap usko ek samajik bhav mein bhi badal sakte hai. Yes. That's a very good uh, point to make. Go um, I, I this is not a question that I want to respond to, but I do want to respond to being called a parasite because I was very active um, in oh, student. Joseph. I was very active in student politics um, and student activism in, in the EU. Um, and Saket, of course, has responded to the to to the comment on fee hike and what it means. You know how much the paying those 20 rupees mean mean for the for you know for students of the country but i do want to talk about you know why is it why is why is it that professors here um, do not professors here do not support political participation of students right politics is not just for people in political parties politics is not just for people outside um, outside these institutions, politics is for every single citizen, including including the students in JNU, including the students in DU, and 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 a university is a you know and a university as adults as, a, as in a university you know a, a university is a space to debate, to talk, to participate in protest, to to exercise our constitutional rights. Um, to say that it's not a space for that, to say that. Activism is parasitic activity or whatever you call it. It's deeply offensive and completely wrong and very unacademic, like I have to Thanks. say. What is, what is unacademic is the straw man fallacy that you don't represent what somebody said accurately and you represent a very weak version of it and then try to refute it. The primary purpose of a university is to get an education, not to do politics. That's what I said. I did both. No, one minute. You did both, so I'm not calling you Everyone a can parasite. Do both. No, no, there are people who shut the university down and do only politics. That's what I oppose. You attend classes, rest of the time is yours. Okay, so please read the book and don't misrepresent what I said. Okay. Now, I want to come to the main point, which is Desh Bhakti. Look, yesterday there was a panel in this hall about the Shakti Peets, you know, the idea of mother worship is very old in this, in this country. So the different parts of the mother goddess are all over the subcontinent. That is the sacred geography of India. And in 19th century, Bunkin created the idea of Mother India, Bhavani Bharati. Okay. And this was used to mobilize people to throw out the British and to unite the country. Now, you want to reverse all of this. Bhakti simply means, look. We are a nation, as he said, bhav samarpan, bhav dete hain, bhav lete hain. This is an emotional country. That's why Bollywood films are melodramas and tear jerkers. And the real point is, who is a bhakt? A bhakt is somebody who is not vibhakt, somebody who is not divided. And that is the point. And I want to make one last point. 
we talk about that gentleman said 60% voted against so and so that's not the point the person who was the jnu student association president got 800 votes okay and out of 8000 possible students but he had or 1200 votes so he had 250 votes more than the second person and he says somebody who got 32% of the votes of the entire country of 1.4 billion is not legitimate he is legitimate with 1200 votes this is the kind of what i call the idiocy the half baked thinking and i want to end by this this country has thought phobia this country has competence phobia this country has truth phobia so unless you get out of these we really have to give the last sorry the organizers want sorry i need to speak every i i have my Give him one minute. Seconds. Thank you. Say, Please do not you. interrupt. Me. Yeah. I'm so sorry. So, as writers, we should try and understand instead of arguing. As far as I'm concerned, I believe in constructive conversation rather than or as opposed to destructive criticism. And so, I will start by reading each of your books and try to get a better sense of what your perspectives are rather than keeping on arguing. And as long as we are able to have this sort of conversation, we are good to go. We are good as a country. We what should not be so way of wrapping up this pessimistic country. about all of it. Thank you so much. We'd like to thank Saket Suman, Makaran Paranjpe, Gurmeher Kaur, Badri Narayan, and Mukulika Banerjee for this incredibly riveting discussion. And we hope to see you at future sessions of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival 2022. You'll find the authors outside.